Awesome. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Cedric Saba. I'm Director for Emerging Technologies at the Office of the Deputy Attorney General for International Law at Israel's Ministry of Justice. Uh, I apologize for not being here in person. Uh, my colleagues and I had to cancel our flight at the last minute uh, due to the uh, difficult situation here in Israel. Uh, the events taking place here are very sad and it's difficult for me to proceed as if everything's a okay because it's not. Uh, however, I do believe that uh, the topic today is important. And thanks to the support of the panelists and uh, other friends, uh, I'll do my best to make it as interesting as possible. Um, so let's get straight into it. Uh, in this afternoon's panel, uh, we're going to go on a kind of a sci-fi policy adventure. I'm going to ask all of you, uh, our panelists uh, in particular, to project yourselves in, let's say, IGF 2030. Maybe it's taking place on a, an inter gigantic international space station somewhere. Uh, and you're trying to figure out how the international community uh, should deal with this new thing that's happening in technology, whether it might be uh, quantum sensing, quantum computing, uh, quantum communications, uh, human machine interface, uh, um, uh, immersive technologies. And we'll ask our panelists uh, now how they envision the international community taking uh, dealing with these with these issues that could arise in the future. Uh, so as you all know, technology uh, develops rapidly. We're seeing the, uh, disruptions uh, every year, every few years. We're seeing things. Uh, those of us who follow the technology, we see it happening incrementally. Uh, but there's usually like a tipping point where the international community focuses on the next big issue and decides this is what we need to deal with. Uh, only to be replaced by another issue uh, uh, a few years later. Uh, so if just looking back uh, in the days of, uh, you know, when we started with cyber, so everybody was talking about critical infrastructure, and then it was IoT, and now it's uh, ransomware um, in internet governance. And in the past, I remember talking, having a lot of discussions about uh, uh, jurisdiction and then content moderation. And now we're talking about, uh, you know, decrypting uh, uh, companies uh, providing assistance to decrypt uh, uh, child sexual exploitation material. Uh, for AI, no sooner than we were talking about a high, a, uh, high risk AI and, uh, you know, we had in mind biometrics and, and uh, discrimination, and then all of a sudden uh, generative AI becomes uh, the thing we're talking about. So this is the known challenge of how uh, law and policy play catch up to technology, and maybe it can't really ever catch up. Everything is highly dynamic. And there's never a point at which international organizations can just say, you know, we can pack our bags now. Our work here is done. Uh, it's always evolving. And one specific issue I'd like to explore today is whether an agile and bottom-up approach can help international institutions uh, deal with these challenges. Um, uh, I'm thrilled to introduce to you um, an absolutely all-star cast. Uh, so we have online uh, Carolina Aguirre, uh, professor at the Universidad Católica del Uruguay uh, in the Department of Humanities, and also former member of the UNESCO Expert Working Group um, on AI. Uh, we have uh, Gaia Daor, uh, policy analyst at the OECD, who coordinates the activities of uh, CDEP. We have uh, Sheetal Kumar, head of the engagement and advocacy at, um, at Global Partners Digital. Uh, uh, Dr. Alzbeta Krasova online, uh, who's head of the Center for Innovation and Cyber Law Research at the Institute of State and Law in the Czech Academy of Sciences. Uh, and Chris Jones, uh, director of technology and, and uh, at the technology analysis directorate at the foreign uh, UK foreign commonwealth and development office and of course uh, ambassador schneider uh, thomas schneider uh, who's uh, ambassador and director of international affairs at the uh, swiss federal uh, office of communications in the federal department of uh, the environment transport energy and communications and to me he's chairperson extraordinaire at kai in the uh, Council of Europe. Uh, so the structure of this session will be uh, as follows. Um, we'll divide it into three parts. Uh, I'll try to finish talking soon so we can give the floor to the panelists. First, we'll talk about uh, the challenges of internal, uh, international governance uh, that are presented by the next wave of disruptive technologies and maybe looking at the past of AI and, and, uh, and internet uh, governance to see what we can learn. Uh, then we'll explore um, whether principles of agile, agile governance and in particular bottom-up principles that, that we know from domestic policy can be sort of internationalized and harnessed to deal with global tech governance. And lastly, we'll try to identify 
summarize some uh, common principles that can be long lasting and future proof to enable a certain degree of institutional agility without losing sight of the important things. For each of these topics, I'll ask one or two panelists to share their thoughts, and then the other panelists can chime in. And then uh, Alzbeta, towards the end, will provide some concluding remarks and observations, and hopefully we'll have some time for Q&A. Uh, one disclaimer, uh, it's uh, what I'm going to say is my own personal views, not necessarily the views of the, the government of Israel. Now, before we start, um, just a second. Uh, before we start, um, and just to change things up a little bit, the panel includes a challenge for you, the audience, uh, in presence, in person and online, and also for the panelists. So I've asked the panelists to pick a few songs and artists that they like. You see them on the right, and the names of the panelists are on the left. And I also picked a song. And I selected from these the songs that connect with our panel today. Uh, and also, I used Bing's Image Creator to generate some really uh, nice images that are inspired by the song titles. Uh, the challenge for all of you is to try and guess who picked which song, and all the speakers, including me, will be including a small clue in the presentation to help you figure it out. Uh, and you can give your answers to me in the Zoom chat or to any one of the panelists. I was planning on giving the winner some kind of small prize, but obviously I can't right now, so I'll try to keep that as a rain check for next year's IGF or some other way. Uh, so now that all these explanations are uh, out of the way, uh, let's get right into it. Um, so let's start talking about the challenge. So I'll ask, I'll address first uh, Thomas and Carolina. Um, so the challenge for international organizations. One question is what lessons can we learn from uh, our experience with internet governance and AI governance uh, to the, in order to address the next wave of disruptive technologies? Specifically, what do you think should be the role of international bodies in addressing, addressing global digital uh, governance challenge? Uh, I'll paraphrase uh, something that I heard a few days ago from my friend uh, David uh, Fairchild in, a, in another session. Uh, many of the in international bodies right now are, you could say, analog bodies, and we're asking them to deal with uh, problems of a digital world. And also, if you can briefly address what I think is an elephant in the room, which is geopolitics that have a major role to play in, in shaping the debate, for example, uh, ITU discussions on internet governance, uh, um, difficulties in making progress in the UN ad hoc committee on cybercrime. So can we really have a meaningful discussion on desirable and implementable global policy goals in light of geopolitics? So we'll start with uh, Tomas and then uh, Carolina. Okay, sometimes it helps to turn devices on. <laughs> uh, it's a pity that you're not here, but of course we do understand this, but I hope to see you again uh, soon in Strasbourg, actually. Um, yeah, it's a, I think it's a nice setting because it tries to be a little bit more forward-looking than, than other, other sessions, so, so uh, and, and hopefully a little bit, uh, let's say, also inspiring in a different way. Um, well, the challenges are, uh, let's say, substance-based and then there are geopolitical challenges and it, this doesn't go just for intergovernmental organizations, it actually goes for all those that are somehow dealing with policy and, and with rulemaking that um, maybe I have to start with like this is a crucial moment in history and things have uh, will be completely different tomorrow than they have been yesterday because this is what you hear uh, throughout history, ever since uh, hi uh, speeches are, are recorded, every person thinks that that particular moment in time is the uh, moment where everything will change. And it's true, uh, everything changes every day, but it's also there's recurring patterns in human behavior, not just in physics, but also in human behavior. So to cut the long story short, I think, but nevertheless, we have an, an extremely fast development of technologies, um, of growing complexity of, of being less material, which has effects compared to technologies that used to be like material based because you couldn't copy them so quickly, you couldn't move them so quickly, you cannot apply them uh, remotely, you cannot use a car remotely in another while being in another continent, for instance, and so on and so forth. So there are many similarities with previous disruptive technologies in the way that humans reacted to it, in the way they were regulated, but the disruptiveness of the, of the new technologies, I think, uh, are of a different nature that has Im implications. And it forces us as rule makers or as a society to 
to adapt, but I, I'm, I'm not sure whether we have to adapt in the sense that we have also learned to think quicker and calculate quicker in our brains. That may be difficult, but so we have to actually probably change the way at which we look things. We may have to look at things a little bit more, again, like maybe with the Greeks and the Romans from a little bit more of a distance and say, okay, what are the big developments? And trying to understand them and then maybe use machines and use algorithm algorithms to develop uh, regulation and develop concepts to cope with with algorithms because our brains may not be able to compute the nitty-gritty details also with regulation um, uh, for, for for this and for instance to give you an example we have parliamentarians now in switzerland that use chat gpt to formulate parliamentarian in, uh, um, interventions and requests and we are not yet allowed, but we are waiting for the moment where we on the side of the, because it takes resources to answer these requests and the more we get, the more resources we need. And an efficiency gain for us would be if uh, we could also answer, uh, the, write the reports that are supposed to uh, uh, reply to the parliamentarian interventions with uh, ChatGPT. So in the end, you have two machines talking to each other, and we can both go on holidays, the parliamentarians <laughs> and the administration. I think that's a, a, a something to think about in the end. But now, to be serious, so we need to find ways to become more agile, more dynamic, without becoming stressed. So we are going in the wrong way if we try to do things quicker. We have to do things differently as human beings in general, but also as rule makers. So we need to use the new tools to solve, uh, to face the challenges that the new tools uh, create. So otherwise, I think it won't work. Don't ask me how I'm not a technician. Maybe Vint and others know, but at least on a concept level, I think we need to get find a different approach. And just two words to the geopolitical environment. And this is something that, um, as somebody who has been in, in this since the WISIS since 2003, in that period, we were all still like, uh, in the hope of the end of history with the fall of the Berlin Wall, with Nelson Mandela, with like uh, people with charisma, avoiding wars, creating peace, bringing people together. And we were hoping that the new technologies would bring us together, would strengthen a rules-based international order based on, on shared values. Unfortunately, we somehow have lost the track, and in particular, the leaders beat Dictators or be it leaders that have been elected by more or less democratic processes are losing track of this notion of cooperating is better, uh, better than fighting against each other. And I just hope I'm also a historian that we don't need to go to really ugly wars in order to realize that cooperation is better than, than fighting each other. But for the time being, it seems a little at least unsure how we how we deal with this and and then of course technologies are not just new tools to do good things but also to do bad things and i don't i'm not a, a, a prophet so i will not go into detail but i think we should realize and we should work together with people that realize that working together is is is, is actually sustainable it's also more fun it doesn't just create less harm it's actually also more fun than working against each other because if that's not the case, no intergovernmental institution or multi-stakeholder institution works because it's all built on the notion of we cooperate together. So you can't blame the ITU or the UN for not producing results if those that are uh, shaping it that have the say, i.e. the member states or the stakeholders in multi-stakeholder institutions are not willing to cooperate. So this is just a few thoughts of mine. Thank you. Carolina, uh, you're up next. Uh, can you hear us? Yes, thank you. So um, to address uh, the, this questions and uh, following on Thomas's interve intervention, so um, I, I do think that we 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 have uh, nearly twenty years of experience on our back with uh, dealing with an, an open technology as the internet, and then uh, with AI governance um, as as, a, as an emerging challenge, a global challenge, but that also is spread out uh, very much everywhere. Um, I, I, I do think that we still need to make uh, strong efforts in keeping up uh, the momentum on on spaces and, and processes that uh, achieve some kind of, um, in a way, what the IGF does in terms of, of its openness and um, 
and bottom-up spaces. Um, and uh, we are seeing that kind of reflection around some of, uh, of the AI governance um, developments, which, which look positively at, at spaces such as, as the IGF and, and some of the internet governance um, approaches uh, that have been uh, taken over the last nearly two decades. Um, um, we, we do need to sort of uh, try to understand the limits and the and the um, uh, actors that are shaping uh, these ecosystems. So uh, in that respect, um, I, I do believe that uh, that keeping up this effort despite uh, maybe the less positive um, um, and, and maybe less vibrant sometimes um, mood that we may have towards these processes um, is is very, very relevant um, in line with with what uh, Thomas was mentioning concerning cooperation as well with uh, trying to get to some kind of, of a mutual understanding. I also think that um, trying to get to um, to the idea of, of, of working together is is also um, related with uh, with the the third um, part of, of this intervention of, the, of the, the question the prompt that you raised it, Rick, uh, concerning the geopolitics uh, because we are in a different uh, time and, and moment uh, uh, concerning um, uh, globalization so geopolitics today uh, is unfolding as it did unfold differently uh, in the early 2000s but um, or late 90s um, and now um, those states are certainly extremely important I mean so many of these uh, new technological developments as in the past they are also being shaped and um, and taken forward by the private sector and so when we talk about geopolitics um, and, and address technological changes and technological momentum, I mean, we, we do have to also address the, the elephant in the room on how to sort of uh, work and, uh, and define the, the scope and space for action for this uh, private sector that has uh, an increased power and and we are seeing that kind of momentum also shaping how how we we address and and have concerns on how uh some of these uh, new technologies have uh, are being sort of developed in 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 behind closed walls and are much less open by nature uh in terms of what the internet originally was and still is so um and finally as a final observation i mean when we think about the developments of of uh, these technologies including the, the internet. I mean, the technology is, is never neutral. Technology is never um, non-reliant on societal values. So uh, we do have to keep uh, that in mind when, when thinking about developing international processes around uh, these uh, new technologies. Thank you. Um, okay, thanks, Carolina. I want to give a bit of uh, uh, the opportunity to other panelists to just chime in. Um, it almost seems like hearing from uh, both of you, uh, Thomas and Carolina, I, I'm grossly oversimplifying, but it's almost like you're saying, we're okay. We The institutions we have are, are in place. The, the world is what it is, and uh, we'll just have to deal. Carolina, you're, you're not agreeing. So I misunderstood. Could you could you just refine what I'm saying? I, I'm I'm certainly not saying that we are okay. I I do uh, think that we do have uh, some interesting uh, foundations, uh, but that the challenges ahead are enormous, and particularly because we are not. Um, uh, as um, keen as, as Thomas, I think, as I understood him, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, was stating that we are in a different moment in terms of, of, of how we address global cooperation as one of the angles to address globalization. Um, globalization is in decline and there in, in many respects and concerning trade, concerning international dialogue. Uh, so I do think that uh, it is in, indeed an extremely challenging moment and maybe probably most of the processes that we are see, seeing concerning uh, internal, internationalization are really not up to uh, the challenges that we face with the development of these uh, technologies. Okay, I'd like to give a few moments for um, uh, Chris or um, anyone in the room, um, if you want to, um, to relate to what you just heard. 
Uh, I think that's a prompt, isn't it, Cedric? I think you want me to say something. Um, so, you know, first oh, of all, Cedric... not specifically you. <laughs> so I will. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. And Cedric, I'm sorry you can't be with us here personally, but I'm really happy to see you safe, albeit on a screen. So, you know, best of luck with everything that's going on. Um, look, I agree with what both of my co-panellists have just said. Um, geopolitics is a messy business, particularly right now. Um, but I think there's an opportunity here to focus on the areas where we agree, not on the areas where we disagree. And too often, and I'm sort of stilling my remarks from later, too often I feel we start with too big a picture. So we try to do too much in one go. I'm an engineer, and my natural tendency is to break things into the smallest possible component I can because I've got a very small brain. And that means I can understand them, I can fix them, I can make them work. And I think there's some parallels here for how we work in our multilateral and international organisations in helping address some of these challenges. Uh, okay, I'll, um, uh, I think that there's a lot to unpack in everything, uh, uh, but we'll have the opportunity to continue to delve in. So, uh, I'd like to go now in a little bit of the uncharted territory. Uh, we heard uh, in a few panels in the last few days, uh, the idea of agile governance and sandboxes in domestic regulation in order to smartly regulate AI. And what I wanna ask is whether this idea can be useful for global governance as well. Uh, are international organizations capable of being agile? Is that, or is this concept maybe completely antithetical uh, to the way they're meant to operate? Um, when we talk about bottom-up regulation, uh, the underlying idea generally is that rather than top-down where you have like a central institution that promotes and implements uh, processes for its constituents, uh, in, in bottom-up we empower the constituents to deal with the issues based on their concrete needs from the ground. Uh, we see the good in everyone's contribution. So can bottom-up and multi-stakeholder processes contribute to the quality of global governance mechanisms? And if so, how? Uh, practical examples of bottom-up uh, approaches to consider, and uh, I invite you to, uh, you know, uh, address any one of these or all of these or maybe something else. Um, one example that's already done in it to a certain, to a large extent by the OECD is fostering policy experimentation uh, by allowing exchanges of views. Uh, so setting up the Protect Policy Lab for international information sharing. Another one is actually fostering the experimentation by states by uh, allowing for a space in which states can maybe succeed and fail in certain examples, and then learning collectively from the successes and successes and failures. Uh, another one is maybe integrating in the bottom-up approach, integrating other stakeholders that maybe are not traditionally in the conversation. One example that comes to mind from our experience with AI in Israel is small and medium enterprises. Um, and also maybe encouraging rulemaking rule by specialized networks. So instead of having, for example, the large generalist organizations that, that deal with the big issues, um, having, you know, like networks of, for example, privacy regulators or cybersecurity regulators or AI regulators in the future uh, to deal with things on their own. So I'll ask um, Galia and Chris, uh, I'm turning to you as well again. Uh, I think each of you have unique viewpoints that, uh, that, I, that you can share, so I'll ask you to go first. Yeah, thank you. So I'll go first, um, just because I, I've been asked to. So um, first of all, I'm interested in these songs, and I really hope people in the audience are doing better than I am, because I have no clue. But when Cedric first suggested it, I thought Ambassador Schneider was actually going to play them all, which, which would be amazing. Um, look, I, I think it's a little bit of a loaded question, being at an event organised by a large international organisation, about whether they can be agile. Um, because I think that could be quite a dangerous place to go. But, but I do think they can. I do think large organisations can be agile, but not in the way that we're currently organised and the way that we operate. So I think there are some parallels we can take from agile software development, where we define small chunks of activity, and we work out how we define those. We don't define the order in which we deliver them, we just define what they are. And the plan is always to get better. So to incrementally deliver more rather than trying to deliver everything in one go. And I think there's a parallel there for how we work internationally. That's what we're trying to do with the UK's hosted AI Safety Summit. So we can't do all of AI. So on the 3rd of November, AI is not going to be solved. 
But what we can do is focus on a very narrow slice and get some broad international agreement. And I think there's something we can do there. The second thing I wanted to talk about was different types of governance. And I think we always tend to focus on values first. We try to agree what are the values we want to see. And this, I think, comes to the geopolitics. I don't think we will ever agree on a common set of values. Different countries are different countries for a reason. You know, we have different national identities. We have different things that are important to us. And we have to embrace that diversity. It's what makes us unique. But that doesn't mean there aren't some common values we can agree. So I think we absolutely should focus on that. But there's another type of governance, the, sort of the technical governance. So the things that we need to have in place in order to be able to interoperate, to talk, to work together. And I think it's often easier to focus on those because we can get the engineers to be focusing on the really practical details of what does it take. I think there's a difference between how and what. And I think very often we focus on the what, whereas what's really important is the how. And I'll give you the example of the UK's online harms legislation. So that has taken us six years, and we're nearly there. But even when we get there, you could never pick that legislation up and give it to another country. It just wouldn't work. But what would work is the process of how we got there. So there's some key things that you need to do to be able to develop that type of legislation. You need to define what constitutes a vulnerable group. There'll be some common themes. So children, I think everybody agrees that children are a vulnerable group. But different minority groups will be different in different countries. So sharing the process, the how, I think is important for bringing these things together. Cedric, you talked about multi-stakeholderism. I think that is critical. I think all governance needs to be multi-stakeholder because nobody has all the answers. So governments certainly don't have the technical expertise. Technology companies don't have the legislative expertise. And none of those really understands the impact on citizens that civil societies organisations have. And I think the IGF is a great example of how you bring that multi-stakeholder organisation together. I mean, look at the range of organisations here. So you know, whether you're the boss of a telecoms company or whether you're a Ministry of Foreign Affairs official like me, they couldn't be more different. But we're all here talking about common issues. And then finally, I just wanted to talk about, Cedric, you wanted an example of bottom-up and where this has worked. And I, I really like the example of the airline industry, where there's a need to work together and agree common standards. You know, we needed to fly planes from one country to another. So we needed a way to share data, a way to build planes that could fly into different territory. And that really forced people from a bottom-up perspective to work together. Now, I wonder what the parallel might be for artificial intelligence or quantum or, dare I say, it, human rights. So thank you. Um, I'll hand over to my colleagues. Uh, thank uh, you. Cedric, yeah. I don't know if we want to respond to that first or... No, go ahead, Gaia. Um, thanks. Okay, so um, thanks for this. I do love how all your um, examples are. I'm an engineer, so I like to break things into little bits. And uh, so I'm a lawyer, so I like process. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I think, um, but I, I, I think that that is part of the, the, will be really part of my answer because I think, um, yes, it's very common to think that intergovernmental organizations can't do that, that um, you know, what's agility got to do with like anything like intergovernmental organizations. But I think partly it's by design because if we want to be, and I'm speaking from the perspective of an intergovernmental organization, if we want to be accountable to our members, if we want to be transparent, if we want to have multi-stakeholder consultations, if we want to be evidence-based, if we want to be thorough, it's hard to also be fast. Um, so we, if and if we want to, maintain the credibility that would mean that stakeholders actually want to come and engage with us because stakeholders have limited capacity and limited time and they would only come if the conversation's worth it. Um, then I think we also need to make sure that we uphold these standards. Um, nonetheless, 
um, the world is changing and things are happening and in particular in the technology area things are happening very fast so we can't just stick to the way that we did things 60 years ago for example when the OECD was um, established um, and I think um, you know Cedric you mentioned sort of um, playing catch up with technology or sort of trying to be more uh, anticipatory and sort of more planning ahead and I think I think we're we're, we're moving there, and um, I, I think I, I can give sort of a couple of examples uh, from the OECD's perspective of I think where we're, we've tried to both be agile and to have this multi-stakeholder bottom-up um, approach. And so one example that you mentioned briefly earlier is the, the OECD AI principles um, that, that were adopted in, in 2019 and the f were the first uh, intergovernmental standard on AI. Um, so I think that's one thing to say about that is it's the uh, it was the fastest process ever at the OECD to develop a recommendation. So we did that basically in one year, uh, which sounds like a lot, but really isn't uh, for something that's that's so complex and obviously builds on a lot of work that had been done before. But the process itself was was remarkably fast, and. Um, nonetheless, was also absolutely uh, multi-stakeholder and, and interdisciplinary, and I don't think we would have gotten there. Um, I'm sure we would not have gotten there without that that kind of engagement. That that was essential. Um, also on the the AI front, then um, we are now as part of the the work to support countries and and organizations and implementing these principles. So we have a very extensive uh, network of AI experts um, with almost with more than 400 experts uh, from different um, stakeholder communities from different countries, um, and that actually helps us. It sounds like it's a it's a big machinery, but it actually helps us move um, fast. And I think it's a it's a really helpful model because we can. Like Chris said, we can break it up to little bits um, and little working groups that sort of focus on different aspects, and we can also adjust. So we started with one set of working groups, but we now have, uh, we've evolved them. So we now have a group that focuses on compute, which isn't something that we didn't work on at first. We have a group that focuses on climate. We have a group that focuses on AI future, which is sort of a generative plus plus what we might see uh, coming ahead. So I think that's that's sort of perhaps one example. And then uh, beyond AI, uh, AI has taken up a lot of um, space in the discussions that I've been in uh, over the last couple of days. Um, so, so beyond AI, sort of looking at um, emerging technologies and also looking at my colleague Elizabeth here. Um, we've At the OECD, we, we um, created uh, the Global Forum on Technology um, about a year ago with a lot of support from the UK, uh, but really as a, as a, as a global um, venue for dialogue uh, on emerging technologies and sort of um, anticipating and preparing for the opportunities and challenges that, uh, they, that they might bring. And I was looking at Elizabeth because she's actually leading this project. Um, and, and it's both sort of um, uh, multi-stakeholder by design, but it also lets us sort of um, try to move relatively quickly on these different uh, technologies, for example, quantum, for example, uh, immersive technology. So I don't know if that, that's not to say everything is perfect to your question, uh, but I think there are ways to, to try to address some of these um, by design challenges and how uh, international organizations are built. Okay, thanks, uh, Gaia. Uh, here too, I'd like to invite um, maybe uh, Sheetal, who hasn't spoken yet, um, as well as uh, Thomas, um, uh, Carolina, Zbeta, whoever um, would like to just add in their two cents on this, uh, this agility question. Can you, yes, okay, great. Thank you first for having me here. Um, let me start with looking at the, I was looking at the session description and all of the uh, technologies that are listed there. Um, the emergence of new tech like quantum related developments, metaverse platforms, nanotech, human machine interface. And it all sounds like, you know, going to a theme park and maybe having a great time. But actually, for a lot of people, this, this future could be, could be a very difficult one. People who are already uh, marginalized women, um, it's not necessarily going to be a good future just because the technology is different or faster or more complex. So as I think Carolina was saying, technology is never neutral. And so what we can do about that is ensure that the development of it um, and indeed the governance of it is more inclusive. 
Um, so we can't predict the future. I don't think any of us would claim to do that. But what I think I can say with some certainty is there's going to be 24 hours in every day in the future, unless something changes. So <laughs> that's really a point around resourcing, right? So if we have 24 hours a day, we sleep for about eight hours, ideally. Um, the rest of the time, what do we do with it? We'll work, try and shape this world that we're in. Um, and what I would say is that there are spaces already where we're doing that work and they can be improved, as I think Chris was saying. We can, we can work with what we, we have um, and make things better incrementally. What does that mean for multi-stakeholder spaces where these discussions are happening? I think improving those, making them more open where standards are being developed, making those more diverse. Um, the strengthen, strengthening the IGF, for example, and connecting the discussions that happen here with the discussions that happen elsewhere in multilateral spaces. So to give an example from the IGF, because we're here, and I presume we all care about the IGF, that's why we're here, and I've been involved in some of the intercessional discussions at the IGF. Um, and what I think is a good example is, for example, the Best Practice Forum on Cybersecurity. It's an okay example, I'm actually going to say, because I think it could have been better um, we, we are having discussions at the, at, well, the UN is having discussions about how to ensure that states behave responsibly in cyberspace. They've developed norms. They are continuing these discussions. How to implement them has been an ongoing one. And so the best practice forum over the last few years has been taking the norms and analyzing cyber incidents, big, large cyber incidents that we're all um, familiar with and assessing how those have impacted people like first responders and the people on the ground to inform the implementation of that. These are multi-stakeholder uh, working groups or intercessionals and we have had um, governments and others I involved, particularly with the policy network on internet fragmentation actually. It would be great, I think, if governments and industry and other stakeholders because and civil society prioritized having in, in their, in their um, portfolios time to engage with these forums to, and to bring therefore back because we have to connect these spaces through people. We don't have to connect them always through some novel technology with what they're doing elsewhere. And that way we can strengthen and empower, um, I think, our spaces to be more, more um, uh, diverse and more inclusive. That also goes to opening up multilateral spaces, um, more through consultations, through engagement, um, and through modalities that really allow for meaningful inclusion. So final point then, I guess, is that future-proofing doesn't have to be high-tech. It can actually be quite basic. Uh, it can actually be quite simple. Um, of course, it can't. We, I'm not saying not using um, a generative AI to help you with your reports to us wouldn't be a good idea. But um, it doesn't always have to be that way. And I think we have some basic things that we haven't done that we need to do better. And um, th those are some examples which I, which I hope help. Thank you. Does anybody else uh, 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 want to say something about this concept of agility? I'm not seeing anyone. So, okay, we'll, we'll try to package everything uh, a little bit later. Um, so now, uh, oh, before I move to the next slide, I was pointed out um, the, the person who chose the song from Rage Against the Machine, I won't disclose who it is. Uh, I, I made a mistake in the, the title of the song. It, the song is called Take the Power Back. So uh, I'll have to change uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the image uh, later, but anyway, so keep that in mind. We're moving now to the next, uh, uh, I guess, the final uh, theme for today. Um, so I think it makes sense to say, and you, uh, you've all kind of like hinted at these uh, these concepts before, I think, uh, Shital and uh, um, and also Gaia, uh, all of you who've spoken about multi-stakeholderism, uh, multi stakeholder sorry. So I think it makes sense to say that that uh, ag agile governance, if it's this kind of theme that we're trying to uh, to uh, enshrine in, in the way international organizations uh, work, um, it doesn't operate in a in an absolute vacuum. So uh, there there should be, I guess, you could say maybe like a, a subtle line between agility and maybe anarchy, uh, between experimentation and free for all. Uh, so if the the question I think that that begs to be asked is are there any kind of like universal principles of global tech governance that should be kind of promoted across the board? Uh, here in the image I connected, um, 
uh, the song uh, Born to Run by Bruce Springsteen because it includes the, the line, I want to guard your dreams and visions, which I think is a nice metaphor for the idea of uh, responsible innovation. Um, so we have all these common buzzwords that have served us well, I think, uh, so far uh, in internet governance and AI governance. So buzz words like multi-stakeholderism, uh, interoperability, uh, human rights that apply offline, apply online, uh, trustworthy, human-centric. Um, so do you think these concepts remain relevant for all other technologies, such as immersive technology, human-machine interface, all the quantums? Or do you think maybe they all apply, but they apply differently? Or do you think we might need to come up with new uh, concepts and frameworks that enable us to grapple with the new challenges? Um, also, a lot of the issues are cross-cutting. So when we talk about, you know, we don't want fragmentation, but we actually see a fragmentation of processes within the UN. Uh, there's the ITU, UNESCO, the Human Rights Council, uh, WIPO, and then outside of the UN, we have, you know, the OECD, COE, the, the, um, uh, the EU, of course, um, which is a major player. And then we have topic-specific initiatives like uh, GPA, like the AI Safety Summit uh, that Chris mentioned earlier. Um, so is this fragmentation of efforts, is this, in your opinion, a feature or a bug? Um, so I'd like to ask Sheetal first to address this question. Any universal principles? Should we be aiming for fragmentation, allowing for fragmentation? Um, what do you think? Sure. Uh, thank you for the, those questions. Um, I think there's something semantic sometimes when we talk about this topic and fragmentation. If it's diversity, then then great. Um, if it's also, for example, normative efforts that are all aligning and, and um, reinforcing common principles, then great. Um, if it's duplication, um, and as I said, we have limited resources if we're, we're going to different places trying to do the same thing, but, but spending our time um, actually developing different frameworks that are, that are competing, then no, it's not. And there is a risk of that if we don't coordinate and collaborate on some of these emerging issues. There is a lot, as um, I think we heard earlier, around um, AI at the moment happening on how to govern that. But at least we have, and this is, I know, something that people have felt fatigued about at this IGF, at least we have a space where it, we're coming together and we are hearing about what everyone else is doing. We can, we can try and make those connections and ensure those, those deliber these deliberative spaces, um, ensure the decision-making spaces are inclusive. So not necessarily, I guess, is my answer to you, Cedric. It's not necessarily a bad thing to have um, various processes at play as long as they coordinate and they're inclusive. Um, and I also just wanted to point out earlier what I mentioned um, about the importance of connecting what is an open and inclusive deliberative space like the, the UN's IGF, and which is so unique because we also need to remember that the IGF is not this annual event, it is the intercessionals, it is the hundreds of national and regional IGFs that happen every year um, and that provide these spaces for people to come together and very unique in that way. Um, this, is, this is something that we need to preserve and so if we try and create something else that is exactly like that, then that is a problem. But the leadership panel, which I know um, we have a member of here, it is very important to create these um, connections with those who can then take on messages and connect to other spaces. So I think that's what's really important, um, that we need to make ensure that when we're governing these new technologies and building the processes for them, that they're truly inclusive by design. We have... S we have endless tools and ways to do that. We know how to do it. We need to do it. Um, and I would say that, as I said, it's kind of old old governance or old tech for new tech, perhaps. It's not, it's not that complex to, to ensure that information is shared in a timely manner, that information is clear, um, that it can be um, accessed by a range of um, different people, that they're invited to the table. Um, and of course, new technologies can also be deployed to support that. So, um, hopefully, yeah, hopefully we can we can turn our minds, I think, to actually operationalizing what we already have um, and use good examples as those we've we've heard from before uh, to ensure that when we're confronted with these new challenges, the principles. Are oh, you asked me about principles? The principles of transparency and e engagement, of openness, of maintaining user and people's autonomy um, and of preserving openness, all of those are enshrined um, and preserved as we face the new challenges that, that we are. Thank 
Yeah, maybe I'll, uh, oh, does somebody else want to take the mic? Hang on, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, no, I was just, I was just sort of as uh, Sheetal was speaking and also sort of to your questions, I, I, I think one of the things that um, uh, also at the OECD, but I'm sure in other places that we've been thinking about is really this sort of the, the, the gap between what is like the, the fairly high level principles. Uh, you asked Cedric, do we think that trustworthy and responsible and, and whatever are relevant? So I, I think yes, I mean, absolutely. And I think they are relevant to, I don't know about all technologies in the world, but but I think in, in, in principle, yes. Um, we, we want them to be trustworthy. We want them to be responsible or the, the, the development to be responsible. We want accountability. Um, we want uh, that the process will be inclusive. Um, and I think obviously we want sort of alignment with, with human rights uh, where there's, um, there's, there's the potential of, of, of risk of, of human rights, to human rights. Um, and I think that's also to Chris's point earlier I think that that is the these are the core values that I think we we have to like we already did so we have to agree on um, and and so I think yes at the high level but then the question is okay what do you do with that and that's where I think sometimes uh, there would be differences between uh, technologies because I don't know we had an AI discussion earlier and one of the points that was raised really is about the data and how important the data is in the context of AI and how the issues of sort of data that's not representative um, and bias and and so these are things that are perhaps specific to AI might not be the case with a different technology but so we need to be aware that when you implement the the high level principles to a specific technology, that's where you'd have the difference. And I think that that's related to the, the governance question because I think that's where perhaps you'd split or you'd break up things into little bits because that's where you really need the expertise and that's where you might need to have processes happening in, in, in different places. So just a thought, I don't know. Um, Sorry, could I just add something very quickly yeah. on that? Um, it's, it's, I think, yeah, exactly what um, was was said about the, n the need to integrate, I think, these, um, these high-level principles um, on a in, in, in various ways. We are now seeing that um, w all these, these technologies that we're using are impacting so many aspects of our lives in a way that makes, I think it requires us to turn to what we have agreed on. And what we have agreed on is the international human rights framework. So that is already made, already agreed, framework that we can embed throughout um, the supply chain of these technologies through the standards and there are means and there are tech w tools to do that. And so I think that's also very important. And, um, sorry to plug my session tomorrow, but the OHCHR um, is co-hosting with us a session tomorrow on their report on technical standard setting and human rights. So it is really, it's an opportunity, I think, these um, as, as these technologies evolve to ensure that we, we build them so that we have a rights-respecting world where everyone benefits from them, and in that sense, it's it's quite it's it is an exciting theme park. Then I think. If I may, I may hook in, Cedric. This is Thomas. Um, something that 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 always strikes me is when we talk about how how does this need to evolve? Is that while technology is evolving, probably institution will somehow follow human beings themselves are fairly stable over longer period in time in, in the way they function. And if you take, uh, a, a, and, and I'm, I'm often comparing engines as something that has differences, but it has many similarities in a way it's disruptive like AI. Engines were put in machines that were either moving something from A to B, much faster than men or horses or whatever, or cows, or they were put in machines that were producing something, be it food, be it uh, goods, whatever. And uh, it's similar to AI that are used to either generate content or put content new together or to replace not physical human labor, but cognitive human labor. There's less animals that you can replace because animals uh, seem to have less cognitive capabilities. But so it's man power, phys uh, cognitive manpower. And if you look at the reactions, and uh, this is the point I'm trying to make, if you look at the reactions um, of people to engines being used in different contexts, uh, in, in Switzerland, uh, near Zurich, where I live, uh, in 1833, some a group of like home weavers and small and medium we uh, enterprise weavers were burning down uh, a textile factory uh, 
after the government has decided not to ban factories like this to, to, to emerge, which is what they demanded, they just burned it down because they were afraid of losing their jobs. And actually some of them lost their jobs. Of course, then history has shown that actually more new jobs are created through industrialization than jobs are killed. So the fear of losing the job is something that we've had. Then ignorance is another thing. The, the last German Kaiser, Wilhelm II, he used to say somewhere in the early, uh, early 20th century, um, I don't believe in, in, in the automobile uh, that has no future. I trust in the horse. Mm, well, so, um, and there are people that say to him, well, this is not really going to change much and so on. We'll f everything will stay the same. Not necessarily. And then the other one is, again, those that uh, banned things uh, in Graubünden, which is the region in Switzerland that has touristic places like Davos and St. Moritz and others. Uh, the government banned cars from the whole territory of the region in 1900. And only 25 years later, 25 years later, in 1925, they allowed cars through a popular vote because the people thought, like, well, actually, we want to use them. And then the question is, where the people, or this was the government in Graubünden more environmentally friendly or whatever? Probably not. Maybe the, the horse tourism industry, whatever there was, was just better organized in that region that made them ban cars for, for 25 years. So, it, so we have the same reactions to, to new technologies. And we'll probably have the same reactions in, in, in building a network of norms, be it technical, uh, legal, but also cultural norms in how to use not engines, but AI in different contexts with different levels of harmonization. In the airline business, you have a much higher harmonization than in, in the car, uh, the car infrastructure and rules on cars. But you do have technical and, and legal and also cultural uh, uh, ways of dealing with ways of organizing stuff. And the same will happen with AI, and, and then the same needs to happen also uh, with, with the institutional arrangements on how to take these decisions. And, and uh, Wolfgang Kleinrecht and others have already uh, used the frame 10 years ago, like we are trying to solve the problems of the 21st century with the institutional arrangements that we've made in the 19th century, which actually many countries coincide uh, with the Industrial Revolution, that you had kings and kaisers and uh, not really democratic systems only, and, and then more or less in, in line with, with industrial revolution, you had the introduction of parliament, of division of power with, with, with legislative, executive, and, and the court system. Um, so also there, there is some influence on, on technology, not just on the daily lives, but also on the institutional setting. And the notion of multi-stakeholder, I don't think it will go away because we will have to organize ourselves differently now that the, the technology is dematerializing. Maybe the rules making should also dematerialize from, from purely physical, I live in this country now, so uh, the rule is made in this country for this country because if also people move around and if everything moves around, the, the, the physical fixing of rules just because you happen to be somewhere, or even worse, you happen to be born somewhere and have that citizenship and you can only decide about the rules where you've been born and not where you actually live may not make so much sense. So we may have to develop a new way of division of power, not among geographical political borders, but maybe in a more sophisticated stakeholder-based or situation-based or whatever, voluntary group-based uh, 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 schemes that are more representative of the people than our classical 19th century parliaments. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Thomas. That was really, uh, it's, it's amazing to me how sometimes to think about the future, we, we all, it's helpful to look at history. Um, so uh, I would like to now turn to my uh, dear friend, Azbet uh, Izum, to try and package this for us. We don't have a lot of uh, time left, so I think we'll skip uh, the Q&A. Uh, so Azbet, you've been uh, attentively listening to our panelists. I know you've been involved with uh, human machine interface in the past and now, of course, AI. Can you share with us, in your view, some takeaways, some overarching thoughts, action items, um, areas for future research that you think we should be uh, focusing on? Over to you. Thank you, Cedric, and thank you for organizing the panel despite the situation, and my heart goes to Israel. So let me now share quickly, because we don't have much time, my observations. Uh, I made a thorough notes, and I have to say that uh, 
actually all the panelists went so nicely to uh, follow up on each other. So uh, the key messages I will try to uh, summarize from each of them. From Thomas, the, the disruption is too big now and uh, we need to change the way that we look at things which resonates with me very much, and I will tell at the end of uh, my speech why. Uh, Carolina, uh, she said that we really need to define the scope of action uh, right now, and also that uh, the private sector is increasing power, which we need to focus on. Chris uh, focused on finding the common values and sharing the how, which I think all of those are very uh, nice action points. And Gadia, actually, she spoke about multidisciplinar the importance of multidisciplinarity and uh, involving uh, uh, stakeholders. Uh, she tell, spoke about diversity and also about uh, the importance of space uh, where we are coming together and oper operationalizing what we already have. I think those are nice action points that are actually coming together uh, uh, very nicely, and they respond to the questions you had about disruption, agility, and common principles. Now, to my personal observations, I think that uh, the convergence of technologies that we are facing now, that's what uh, Thomas mentioned in the beginning, is the biggest problem. That's something that we really need to focus on. And in my uh, personal opinion, we are kind of crossing the border because with the technologies like human brain, uh, brain computer interfaces, when we are able to peek inside of a human brain, we really are able to cross the physical border of a human body and intrude the privacy of our minds, connected with AI, read the mind and actually even influence the people. We really need to uh, ask the main question now, which is, what world do we want to live in? Because uh, that is crucial. We need to define where we are headed. And it's the place for international organizations to steer the development, to steer it in a way that is thoroughly discussed. And yes, there is this cost of uh, time where we really need to focus on, uh, we, we really need to go deep and we need to give it the time and attention and the thought to see where we want to go. We need to agree on uh, how we are going to operationalize the principles that we are already having. I think that the principles, they need to be implemented to new situations as it was already mentioned. We do have the common values like uh, human life and uh, physical and mental integrity. This is something we need to uh, um, consider in new ways and see what does it mean in different scenarios. That's why also the bottom-up approach is very important because we need to see case by case what is happening and not just think about theoretically what might happen. We need to see what is happening and react as quickly as possible while balancing it with a thorough discussion. And as you said that we need, we should suggest some parts of the song in our final speech, I would like to say that I feel like walking the world, which means for me, we should uh, get to know each other better and better and better and not uh, understand each other just in a rational way, but also in an emotional way, which means we should not meet at one place, we should travel, we should see each other and we should understand each other on the human level, the complete package. And um, maybe this is just too much general of an observation, but this is my position. Thank you. So much else, but I, I, this this uh, session for me, I, I, I wasn't thinking of this, but it kind of occurred to me as we were going, al we were going along, I love the idea of kind of like taking something, breaking it up, like deconstructing and then reconstructing. And I think there was this kind of I, this re recurring uh, concept here of like, yeah, yeah the, a lot of these principles and concepts, we, we, we want them, but we might have to rethink how we do certain things. 
that's not to say, uh, you know, a, a, an absolute revolution is necessary, but kind of just like recalibrating so that we can adapt better for the future. Um, so thank, thanks so much, but uh, I, I know the time is is up and I, like, I would just love this session to continue for another few hours and just hear what everybody has to say. Um, but unfortunately, we, we have to stop now. Uh, I think I speak for everyone here and saying we, we learned a lot. Um, I want to thank uh, the panelists, uh, especially Carolina, who's uh, I think it's the quite early in the morning for you. Um, your your uh, interventions, I think they provide the, the, the foundations for some kind of follow up. So maybe next year's idea for or something else. Um, last thing, if you were if you're attentive, and you think you can guess who picked which song, let us know. Um, thanks everybody in the audience uh, in Kyoto and also virtually on the Zoom and on YouTube uh, and enjoy the last day of the IGF. Thanks so much. Thank you, Cedric. And all the best. Thank you, bye everyone.